beautiful passage uh, comes from Isaiah and I wanted to share that with you this morning because I want you to know from the very outset that God is wanting to speak to you, not only speak to you but he wants to express his love to you, not only does he want to express his love but he wants you to come to him this morning, to come to him and drink and partake of him and be blessed because God cherishes you so much. Now I'm going to say good morning, are you ready? Good morning everybody. Oh, you guys rock. It must be Christmas time. I tell you, you're so good at that. Well, it's the coming so close to the end of the year. Carol and I went out on Friday night. Um, Carol had a work do, and we went to a beautiful function centre somewhere near the casino. And uh, I can't remember what it was, but it was the grandeur room or something or other. It had a wonderful view, and there were three or four hundred people there, and we enjoyed a lovely evening. The music was a tad loud. I think that's my age. And, uh, and so you're, you're meeting with new people sitting around the table and there was this really nice couple right next to me and we did the, the obligatory hello, how are you type thing and then they made a huge mistake. They said, what do you do for a living? And uh, I've, like, I hesitated too. I thought, I, might as well t- I st- should say I'm from the tax department, that would be easier. <laughs> or a police officer perhaps. But I said, I'm a pastor at a church and I oversee the running of a counselling centre. And she said, oh... She said, that's so wonderful. She said, my neighbours need people like you. (laughs) She went on to tell me about her neighbour who was single and has four or five children that are out of control and are suffering need. And don't get me wrong, she was a nice lady and she genuinely cared, but her understanding was that God has saved Christians to look after people who are in need and it's not people like her are in need, it's just poor people with no husbands and wives and fathers that are in need. It's a tragic mistake to make because as I sat there and listened to her and only got every third word over the music, I realised that I make the same mistakes that she makes. I think that God needs to help other people and I often forget I actually need God to help me. I think God needs to help my neighbours. I think God needs to help my friends. I have people come in, I have the honour of having people come into the counselling centre who carry heavy burdens and I get to to listen to them share their burdens and I pray that God gives me wisdom to speak to their burden, but God needs to help them and not me. And it hit me like a hammer that actually I have needs too and God wants to meet my needs. Today I pray that you will have the humility to recognise that God wants to meet your need. I pray that you have the humility to realise that you need God to meet your needs and he's the only one that can. I want you to come in your Bibles with me to John chapter 4, page 888, if you'd like to use a pew Bible. Please take one of those. If you don't have a Bible, you're visiting with us and you don't have a Bible, please take that as a gift. You're welcome to take that home. You will not be accosted in the car park by an over-energetic Christian who will purge it out of your hand and thrust you onto the hot bitumen. We will let you get home scot-free. Page 888, come to this beautiful passage of scripture and I want to move through fairly quickly with you because we have a a wonderful story that starts in verse 6 and runs on through John chapter 4. A story, it seems at face value, that is very simple. A, A woman has come out to take water from a well and while she's taking water from the well, she encounters Jesus and Jesus speaks to her. That seems pretty plain, doesn't it? A lot simple. In fact, this passage is laden with meaning, laden with what we call metaphors, where Jesus speaks about water, but what he's actually speaking about is the Holy Spirit. Jesus meets this woman. This is a, a literal story. This is a literal account. But he meets a woman who pictures humanity, a woman who pictures you, a woman who is like me. A woman who is in desperate need. So let's have a look at verse 6 as we begin. It's about the sixth hour. That seems fairly innocuous, doesn't it? But actually that's a revelation right there. Because the sixth hour was, as we know it, noonday. Probably the hottest part of the day. And what John is trying to tell you straight away is this is an unusual time to draw water. This woman was only coming out to draw water because... As you'll read on, you'll find out that she's a woman who's previously had five husbands and the man that she's living with at present is not her husband. And she's a, by implication, she's a social outcast. 
her community look down their nose at her and think to themselves, why in the world didn't her parents raise her better than that? Didn't somebody tell her that that's not the way you, you live your life? Thank the Lord that our children aren't like that. Thank goodness we're not like that. And such was her reproach that she wouldn't come out early in the morning to draw water because the other women from the village would be there and she would feel their scorn and their judgment. She wouldn't come out in the evening time in the cool to draw the water because, again, people from the village were there. So she went in the heat of the day to avoid what she felt so deeply, and that was that she felt like she was a failure. She felt like nobody understood her. She was an outcast. Verse 7 goes on and says that she's a woman from Samaria, which, again, doesn't seem a big deal, but if you understood the context and the history... Jews hate Sumerians. Jews thought that Sumerians were a little bit lower than dogs and that they would never speak to them. In fact, Jews would, if they were travelling from one town to another town and there was a Sumerian town in between, they would go miles out of their way to avoid walking near or through that town. That's how much they hated them. Do you see how this is beginning to weigh heavy with implication for you and I. This woman was a social outcast. She was racially an outcast. She was a woman who was not thought highly of during those times. And thank God for Jesus dying on the cross because he liberated women from this. They were looked down on and despised and considered to be second-class people. But Jesus Christ is actually the one who has raised up women to walk alongside men, to walk along together. And I thank him for that. Her gender, her race, her social status, the moral barrier. This woman, by all accounts, by every account, was a moral outcast. She really struggled. Why did God choose this woman? Because understand this. God has divinely set up this meeting with this woman at a well so that he can speak to her about who he is and reveal to her God in the flesh. It was written 2,000 odd years ago and God wrote it because he wants to speak to you today about who he is. He wants you to look at this woman and look into your own heart and reflect upon where you're at. He wants you to understand what the significance of that well is so that you can understand how much God loves you. Only God could do that. Only God could divinely set up this majestic appointment. Only God could laden what seems to be just a, a chance meeting with so much depth, with so much passion, with so much love. Only God could do something like this that reaches down through the centuries and speaks to us today about his love and care for you. Don't miss that. Don't think you've just rocked up here today for a graduation which was so precious and aren't we to have Matt and Ori leading our children. Don't think for a moment that you just rocked along here to sort of go through the motions before Christmas time. I tell you that God is much bigger than that. His divine appointment with you today, he wants to speak to you through this passage. He wants to tell you that he loves you. He wants to tell you that his grace can change your life. He wants to tell you that life-changing power is for everyone. He wants to tell you that life-changing power is a gift. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Grace is for everyone. He's chosen a woman that from everybody's perspective is the lowest of the lowest. A woman who would have no chance of having any social status or any relationship with God. A woman who has so many barriers, not just one barrier, but barrier after barrier. And yet God is saying to you, they might be barriers to you, but they are nothing to me. You may have been in the worst place. You have may have suffered the worst situations. You might be a moral outcast. You might be a social outcast. You might be a gender outcast. But to me, to me, you are my child and I love you. And I want you to receive me. I want you to believe in me. I want you to invite me into your life. I want to satisfy the deepest needs that you have. Isn't that great news? God would speak to us that way today? There's no barrier to him. How do you fail to get a wage? I've tried to help my boys with this. How do you fail to get a wage? Because sometimes it seems like rocket science to them. 
It's very, very simple. You just don't go to work. <laughs> okay? That's simple. It's just stay home, play the Xbox, and at the end of the week, pray that mum and dad put food in the fridge and fuel in your car. How do you fail to receive a gift? You fail to receive a gift because your pride will not let you do it. Okay? And here we see this beautiful picture of this woman who was utterly broken from the world's point of view, but she had something beautiful, and that was she had the humility to know her position. She had the humility to know who she was before God and was willing to receive the gift that he is going to offer her. I pray for you this morning that you will not let your pride stop you from receiving the gift that God wants to give to you. That you won't think, man, I wish my neighbours were here. They really need to hear this message. I wish my husband was here today. He really, like, he really needs to hear this message. I wish my wife would stop looking at her iPhone and listen to this message because, man, she really needs to hear it. I'm so glad that that guy sitting behind me is here because this message is for him. And by virtue of your pride, you will miss the gift that God is offering you this morning because God's speaking to you, not your neighbor. God is speaking to you, not your partner. God is speaking to you, not the person in front of you. Have a look in verse 10 in your Bibles. Because I want you to see the power. I want you to see the power of this wonderful gift that Jesus is offering to this woman. And Jesus answered her, having met her at the well, and saying to her that he was going to offer her living water. Starting in verse 9, the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, she understood that Jews don't speak to Samaritans. She understood that a Jewish man would never speak to a woman in that setting. It was totally morally wrong to do that. How is it, she says, that you, a Jew, would ask for a drink from a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with the Samarians. And Jesus answered her and said, If you knew the gift... Of God, and who it is that's saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Living water, this beautiful, beautiful picture of water. I'm, I understand that our bodies are made up of 50% water. We, we crave water, we need water to survive. Water can be so sweet. Many times on the building site, I would drink water out of a hot hose because I was just so... Th and you could actually taste the plastic from the hose. It was gross. But it satisfied... You drank, you're satisfied. My dad would often, when we were having a drink, he would say it's not cold, but at least it's wet. Because we craved water so much because our bodies needed it. We lived in a little place called Onslow, and the Ashburton River uh, would often run dry, but the water under the river, as, the, as it flowed underneath, was tested and been... They said that it was the cleanest, sweetest water in Australia. Just beautifully clean. And it was sweet to the taste. So many times when you have eaten, like I, you know, you get Alan snakes, the party pack of Alan snakes. And I think God made them that big because then, like, I had a, I bought a packet for the Alpha course. But we had chocolates instead. So they stayed in my office. And I thought, I'll just open them and have one. So it was a big two kilo packet. I opened it and I had one. And then I think it was the Lord said to me, go I have another one. So, and then he said, I'm sure it was the Lord again, said, have another one. So I had another one. And then I realized the third time it was actually the devil. And uh, I'd got it wrong. But then after you've had, like accidentally, then a few fell off the shelf into my mouth. By that stage, I was sort of, I was getting through about 10 and I was starting to have a bit of a sugar hit. And you, you just crave water. Crave water. I went down to the fridge and got a cold bottle of water and drank it, and it was just beautiful. Just beautiful. I was ready to have some more snakes. <laughs> Don't miss the imagery of what's happening here with the water and the well, because what Jesus is saying to this woman is not just give me a drink of the water out of the well. And not simply am I talking to you about natural spring water that you can get in a bottle. Jesus is saying that I have something for your soul. I have something for our souls that is like water to the body. Something that will revive you and bless you. 
He's speaking about water and he's using water as an image of his grace. He's using water as an image of his spirit. He's using water as an image of what it is to have a relationship with him. And he's saying that when you take God's grace, when you receive the Holy Spirit, when you have a a relationship with Jesus Christ, it's like water to a parched mouth. It's sweet and it brings refreshment and blessing and you will crave more of it when you have tasted it. It won't be a burden to you. Grace so sweet, when you taste it, you'll just want more and more. Living water is the Holy Spirit's empowering of your heart. Living water is the the Holy Spirit's empowering of your heart to be assured of and experience the love of God. God loves you. The woman at the well is a picture of a a broken humanity that on so many levels is not acceptable to God, not even acceptable to their own community. The woman at the well is a picture of us and our relationship with God. There are so many things that from our perspective hinder us having a relationship with God. And Jesus breaks through those barriers and he... He just he walks straight through them. And he says, I, I want you to understand that my love has overcome all the barriers that you think you may have. My love has overcome them. I'm not saying to you that you should go away and, and, and get married. I'm not saying that you should tidy up your life. I'm not saying that you should give up this or give up that. What I am saying to you is that they are not a barrier for you to receive my love. It is not a barrier God is saying for me to say to you, I love you just as you are right now. Isn't that great news? That God would down through a thousand, two thousand years from the beginning of time be crying out to you today, he loves you. God loves you. Isn't that awesome? God loves you. And there is nothing that you have done There is no place that you have been. There is nothing stopping God expressing his love to you. He loves you. So sweet is the water of God. He wants you to experience his love, his presence, his friendship. He wants you to experience his free gift of grace. Law and technique. Because we try so hard to meet our own need. If only... This neighbor that the lady told me about, she went on to tell me only if she could find a man that would be the solution to all of her problems because he could discipline the children, he could provide an income so that they had the things they needed to have and she already had worked out in her mind what the solution was to that problem. And she may be right to some extent. But what we do is we try to meet our need outside of God and we think to ourselves, I'll just try a little bit harder. I'll just work a little bit longer. I'll just dig a little bit deeper and I'll be able to find what I need to sustain my life. I'll find a, a new technique. I'll, I'll join a, a yoga group or one of those, is it, those groups where they stand around and they move really slowly. It was on TV this morning. These folks, old folks, dressed up in really nice clothes like silk dacks and everything else and they're, and they're moving really... I, don't, I think it's because they're so old they can't move any faster, but... I find a new technique and and that will deliver me. But you see, it doesn't. All these things do, techniques, the law, all they really design to do is to restrain the heart, is is to restrict the opportunity. But they don't really deal with the core heart issues. They don't really deal with the depth of the heart. They don't bring real change to the heart. They don't stop the desires coming through. This is where grace is completely different. Grace brings divine transformation to our hearts. Grace brings divine transformation, fulfilling our deepest needs. This is the power of the living water. Power of knowing God. The power of inviting him into your life is he doesn't just come into your life and reform your life or restrain your life. He comes into your life and he transforms your heart and he creates new desires within you and gives you divine power to be fulfilled and enjoy life, to to no longer thirst. 
That's what we need. I need someone who can change my heart. Okay? And it's simple. I've shared this with you before. This is how hard the heart is to change. I was doing a course on how to change, teaching some of you in the congregation on how to change. Okay? Because I've got it absolutely nailed down. So I'm the teacher of that course. I was sitting in the last session. I was playing a Paul Tripp video and uh, thinking, honestly thinking, it had been a nine-week course. I was tired and I was thinking, I want to go home and see Carol. And uh, Paul Tripp talked about how the grace of God, the divine power of God, transforms our hearts, gives us the power to change, which we need so much. The divine water of God, as it were, the divine spirit of God coming in and transforming our heart. And to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and he said that love is not rude. Like, that's a snap. That's like a little thing. Love is not rude. And I realized then that actually I was a rude person to my, only to my wife. To you folks, I try to be Mr. Charming. And I'm smiling and I tell you that I love you and I'm smooching you all the time. And even when I get irritated, I pretend I'm not. But with my wife, because we've been together 32 years this December, 15 just gone, I'm not so nice at times. I come home and I'm short in the way that I speak to her. I don't give a complete answer. Sometimes I ignore what she says. I sit down on the couch like a sloth and get the remote control and I start watching TV and she's trying to tell me about a day and trying to ask me about a day and I'm giving them these clipped answers and it hit me like a ton of bricks right then that, that I needed to take notice of what that was. I needed to change. I went home and I told Carol about what God had said to me and I asked her to forgive me for that. And you can understand, she probably thought, well, yeah, you've done that like uh, with 32 years, you do that every six months, so that's like 64 times and, and give you another few months and you'll be back again. And she was right because I couldn't change myself, you see. I couldn't change myself I needed God to change my heart and it was as simple as this and I say this to you because this is for you today I went in my office I knelt down asked God to forgive me and I said please change my heart I need you to change me because I can't do it I'm pleased to tell you that and I didn't pay Carol for this like three months later she said to me one day without me leading her to it or anything like that she said you've changed and she said, I notice you listen to me and you don't lean around me when the TV to watch the TV when I'm talking. <laughs> it's terrible. And you actually turn the TV down. You've got to, I've got to tell you how much strength it takes to move my thumb onto the volume control and move it. Let's go. Oh, yeah, God, I did it. Praise the Lord. And she said, I, I see that God has changed your heart. God changes not just our situations, but he changes our heart and the motives of our heart. Such is the power of God. I want you to come now to verse 16 because he says to this woman that I can give you uh, living water that wells up to eternal life. Like I can transform you from the inside out. I can make you a child of God. I don't know if she completely understood what he was talking about, but she said, where can I get this water from? Which I thought was a, a winner of a response. Like if somebody offers you something like that, you say, where can I get it from? Look at what Jesus says in verse 16. Go and get your husband and, I, and bring him here. I mean, that just... We were talking about water and now you're talking about husbands. Talk about wrecking the mood of the conversation. At this point in time, she hadn't disclosed to him that she'd had five husbands and the man that she was living with presently wasn't her husband. But you're dealing now with God in the flesh, the divine God who knows everything about us. And it seems as though he's just lost the plot for a second. But actually, he hasn't. It's the perfect answer to her question of where can I get this living water from? It's the perfect answer. And the reason it's a perfect answer is because it's the same thing that you and I need to hear. It's the same thing that you and I struggle with. We are finding our identity. We are finding our hope. Or we're trying to. We're trying to find our peace. We're trying to find our joy in anything but God. And this woman had moved from husband to husband to husband to husband, trying to find peace and hope and fulfillment and a future. And she couldn't do it. And she'd bounce from one to the next, to the next, to the next. And now she was living with the sixth man. 
I assumed she was hoping that at some stage she might get a marriage proposal from him and that, that life would become perfect. They'd get married, they'd have two and a half kids, he'd build a white picket fence out the front and everything would be perfect. You see, he was trying to help her to see that actually Jesus Christ was her, the answer to her need for fulfilment. Jesus Christ was the one who was going to give her her true sense of identity. Jesus was the one who was going to help her find peace and hope as she understood that he made her and that he loved her and that he had a, a plan for her. And she would never find that in a husband. She would never find that in a job. She would never find that in money. She would never find that in her children. But we try. We lean on our partner to, to fulfill us and give us joy when it, God designed it that we could get that from him and him alone. We screw our kids into the ground and try and correct the, the loser of a life that we've had and we hope that by crushing them into the corner and making them a success that somehow that will give us contentment. But it doesn't. We kill ourselves with work and we try and put money in the bank and we spend all our life there and our youth is taken from us and at the end of our life we finally realise and that, that's not where my identity is. That's not where my hope is. That's not where my joy is. That's not the answer I was looking for. Jesus asked her this question because he's saying to us today, he is the place where you find hope. He is the one whom you find life in. He is the one who gives you fulfillment. You see, when I remember that, when I re and I forget this every week, but when I get hold of that again and I get on my knees and I say, God, I remember that you are the one who loves me. You're the one who's forgiven me. You're the one who has saved me. You're the one who gives me a future. You're the one who answers my prayers. You're the one that gives me joy inexpressible. When I remember that, I am a fantastic husband. I don't care. Thank you. That cost me 10 bucks. I hope you appreciate that. What I mean by that is that I don't come home then and try and get a sense of who I am by leaning on Carol. I come home ready to give to her out of what God has given to me. Does that make sense? When I go to my workplace and I'm not looking to get my identity out of my workplace, I'm, I am, by God's grace, ready to give to my workplace and be a blessing. You see that? When I am free from finding my identity in my children, I'm able to love them with God's love. And God's grace. And when I don't, I just get angry and I'm Mr. Grumpy. God is wanting to meet the need in this woman. Um, as a guy by the name of David Foster Wallace, as we're coming to a close, he talks about worship, because this is what we're talking about. What do you worship? Are you worshipping your partner? Are you worshipping a dream to have money, to have a partner, to have a marriage? Are you worshipping... Your car, are you worshipping where you live? Are you worshipping mums? Are you worshipping your children? Because you need to worship God. And he says this, If you worship money and things, if they are where you tap real meaning in life, that's where you get your drive and your identity from, then you will never have enough. If you worship your own body and beauty and sexual allure, you will always feel ugly, and when time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths, finally, till they finally plant you. And you know what that's like. As you get older, like you've got to use masking tape to hold things in place, and you've got straps you can buy and all that sort of stuff, and you can get a, a hair tuck that pulls your face up and all this sort of gear. And it, if, you, if you worship that, you're on a losing streak because you just can't keep up. He says, if you worship power, you will feel weak and afraid and, and you will never, sorry, you will ne need ever more power over others to keep fear at bay. Worship your intellect, being seen as smart, you will end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out. The compelling reason to choose some sort of God or spiritual thing is that pretty much anything else you worship will eat you alive. You get that? How many times have you lost sleep because you don't feel like you're in control because you're worshipping things and not the creator of those things? And that's what he was trying to say to this woman at the well. 
Stop worshipping your husband. Stop worshipping your relationships. Realize that as you come to me, I will fulfill your deepest needs. Jesus says you need something to change what your heart loves the most, what it fixates on the most, what it is that you daydream on. The, the amount of times that you have been driving in your car or sitting in the kitchen or the lounge room and thought to yourself, if I just had $2 million... I do this with God, like, and I try to trick him because I start with two million, and then I get back to two hundred fifty thousand, thinking he's going to think, "Yeah, that's I can handle that." Two hundred fifty grand never works. It never works. I'm, I, one stage I got back to fifty grand. I'm thinking I am so cheap. It's easy to worship the created and not the creator. I am, he says, the only fountain, the only Lord and Master, the only object of worship that is worthy of you worshipping. And get this, he says, it's because I will never abuse you. You see, everything else you worship abuses you because it costs you. It doesn't only cost you, but it robs you and it twists you up and it ruins everything that you're hoping for. And Jesus says, I will never do that to you. I will never abuse you. In fact, if you get me, I will satisfy you. Because I am the living water. Have a look at verse 23. This is such a fruit laden passage, we don't have time to cover it all. But he says this finally But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. When he challenges her about her husband, she tries to deflect. And she, she, then she thinks to herself, well, let's not talk about my husband's or my partner I'm with now. Let's talk about where we should worship. So they have a little theological conversation about worship. And she tries to deflect and deflect and deflect. And that's, he finally says to her about what we should worship and where we should worship. He says, there's a time coming when we will worship God in spirit and truth, where we will not worship on a certain mountain or in a certain place, as which the Jews and the Samaritans did. But there will become a time when God will actually, through his spirit, enter into us and we will become the temple of God and we will worship God anywhere at any time and we will worship God through everything and anything that we do because we're going to live for him and not for ourselves. But have a look at the words there, the hour. Any time you see the, the words hour, when Jesus refers to my hour in the New Testament, particularly in the book of John, he is always talking about his death. He's talking about his death on the cross, which seems fairly morbid. But actually, it's just so beautiful. Because it's the death of Jesus on the cross in our place that's made it possible for us to be forgiven and have a right relationship with God who gives us living water. He gives us himself. So I ask you today, what is it that you are worshipping? What is it that you have placed before God? What is it that you need God to, to deal with in your life? What is it that's going on in your circumstances where you need to invite God in and say, God, I need your living water? Your marriage is falling apart. You're sitting here today and you're putting on a really good show, but in fact, you've just moved into, you're living in a cold war. Your relationship with your children is broken. You've got adult children and their marriages are struggling, and every time their marriage struggles, your heart breaks and you feel powerless and you don't know what to do about it. You feel captured by it. If you're like us, I've got five granddaughters. Every time they bump your knee, you'd swear somebody drove a knitting needle through your heart. They just have captured it so much. Your finances aren't going the way you want them to go. Your retirement is not looking as sweet as you thought it was. You don't have the love that you want to have. You don't have the person in your life that you, don't, that you so desperately believe you need. And Jesus is saying, stop looking there and look to me, the living water. Invite me into that situation. How many times I've worried over my children, unnecessarily so, but I don't pray about it. How many times I've worried over my work, but oh, do I bend the knee? No way, I just worry about it. How many times Carol and I have wrestled with something and have we had the humility to come to God in prayer? 
We can talk about it all day long. We even say to each other sometimes, we sat on the couch and we said, we should pray about this. And then we change channels. It's time that we invited God into our lives and we invited the living water into our lives and that we drank deeply of him. Today, if you look into your heart and you can truly admit that you are sick of searching for fulfillment, search of, sick of searching for contentment, sick of searching for belonging, searching for those things in your spouse, searching for them in your success, searching for them in the location of your home, in the well-being of your children. If they were only okay, I'd be content and I'd be happy. Looking into your heart, I pray that you can get to a place where you admit that you have been captive to your sin and you're sick of being captive to your sin, sick of being captive to drugs and trying to find a way to escape, giving yourself to others to find acceptance and comfort and meaning, believing that joy and peace are only for other people and not for you. Please listen today and come to Jesus. He is the only one who can truly satisfy the longing you have in your heart. If we receive him and believe that he is the answer to our deepest need, the life that he brings will flow down through our lives and bring us the sweet, sweet grace of God. His life will flow down over all that we face over our marriage, over our relationships, over our finances, over our homes, over the longing of our hearts, and it will bring divine hope, divine joy, peace that's lasting, fulfillment that we've been searching for. When our strength fails and our philosophy has no answer, Jesus freely gives us living water. Grace so sweet, it satisfies all of our questions. It brings peace to all of our troubles. It brings joy in the darkest times. Life forever and abundant life for today. You cannot go so far that Jesus cannot reach you. Your child cannot run so far as you cannot rescue as Jesus cannot rescue them. Your heart cannot be so broken as Jesus cannot bring comfort to you. There is no well so deep that he cannot draw you up, no marriage so damaged, no child so distant, no relationship so hopeless that Jesus cannot meet you in the midst of that need. Isn't that wonderful news? I believe that. I believe that. Invite Jesus in and drink of the living water. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Experience the transformation of what we call impossible but to God is possible. Drink the living water. Experience the love, the peace, the pardon, and the friendship and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Stop worshipping yourself. Humble yourself before God. And give yourself wholly to Him because He wants to come into your life he wants to bring his blessing and his love. He wants to bring his forgiveness and pardon. And all that's stopping, all that's stopping him is your unwillingness to receive him. So I want to pray with you as we close this morning. And I mean that sincerely. I say that to you. When I say I want to pray with you, I'm mindful that often I don't pray over the things that mean the most to me. And so today I want to pray over those things with you because I'm fairly confident you're the same. You would much prefer to worry than worship. You'd much prefer to procrastinate than pray. So let's come to Jesus, the living water, and invite him into our lives. Let's receive his pardon and his blessing as we pray together now. Humble yourselves before the Lord. I ask that you would bow your heads that you would close your eyes and I'd like to pray over you. I'd like you to bring to the front of your mind that thing that you need the Lord to speak into the most. Father in heaven, we humble ourselves before you and we thank you that Jesus is the answer to our situations. 
I ask you to forgive me for the many times that I have worried over my life, worried over all the things that I face and yet fail to pray to you about them. I ask you to forgive me for trying to find fulfillment and hope and peace in the things that are temporal of this world and not coming to you and inviting you into my life. I pray that you would forgive me. And Lord Jesus, I ask that you would come into my life. I ask that you would give me that living water. I lay before you all the things that are heavy on my heart. I lay before you my marriage. I lay before you my work. I lay before you my children, my grandchildren, and all those things that I often worry about. And I invite you into all of those situations. I pray for my family that I often am anxious for and I invite you in to save them and bless them and do what you could do. I invite you into my heart. I invite you into my life. I want to worship you and you alone because you do not abuse me, you do not rub me, you do not leave me thirsty, but you quench my thirst and you fulfill me. And I invite you in now in the lovely name of the Lord Jesus.